lecture. And uh, we will have a Q&A session on Monday because this week was so packed uh, and Horatio has agreed to come uh, at 9 a.m. local time, I think, yeah. Okay, take it away. Well, um, I have described in the, in the last lectures uh, some applications on quantum information to quantum field theory, uh, in particular, irreversibility theorems and uh, bounds on energy and, and, uh, and, and entropy. <clears throat> uh, today, I want to talk about symmetries, how symmetries are reflected in the structure of quantum field theories and, um, and information uh, quantities that one can produce out of symmetries. Uh, but before that, I want to focus on this on this question. Um, wh what are the information measures in quantum field theory? If, if one is interested just in quantum field theory, uh, what, what is the role that they play? So let me ask this. Then, oh, sorry, this. So formulations of quantum field theory. Uh, how do information measures fit? So the, the simplest formulation of quantum field theory is, is about quantum fields. And there is also another formulation that is quite old, that is the algebraic formulation. By Hagen Kastler. In the 60s. And this is um, this formulation is based on operator algebras. In a region. So one takes regions in space time, in Kosky space time, and then um, one considers all the operators that can be attached to this region. For example, we produce by some smear fields uh, inside the region. Uh, in general, the the people take um, not these operators, which are in general unbounded, and then have, may have problems of about the, the, the domain or definition of the, these operators in Hilbert space. So you, you can take a bounded operator, for example, doing just the exponential. So uh, the 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 nice thing of this is is that this is a um, Basis independent formulation in the sense that you are taking all the operators in a region. So, uh, if you have, a, if you describe your theory with different fields, for example, because you have a duality or because uh, some fields will generate the same algebra as other fields, then um, all these. All this is included in the algebra in a, in a region, all these possible fields that generate the same algebra. <clears throat> and we have also that this is a one way, they say, and people do not know exactly uh, when you can go around, you can go in the other direction. And for the quantum field uh, formulation, you have also this very old idea that you can, you can, instead of taking the quantum field, you can take just the vacuum expectation values of the fields, the correlation functions. So the Wittmann functions or the Euclidean functions, 
and this is in the 50s. And so we now you produce numbers out of the fields. And this, in fact, contains all the information of the theory. So you can reconstruct the theory itself by the back expectation values. So if you think in this other formulation about, about algebra regressions, what would be the similar step? So you want to produce a number, a number out of an algebra. And if you think a little bit, there is, for example, from the, starting from the vacuum state. If you think a little bit, there is no other quantities that have statistical properties. Of algebras in a given state, for example, the vacuum. And this, this leads us to the entanglement entropy. What here, in order to have a well defined quantity, we should, we should speak about mutual information or the range entropies. Etc. So the the role of the entanglement entropy and statistical numbers out of the regions of a space play a similar role of giving numbers to something more complicated as operators in this case operator algebra. And one would like to understand how much one can reproduce of the theory based on entanglement entropy. There are good reasons to expect that you can, you can really have the, the whole information of the theory out of the entanglement, for example, in vacuum. Uh, but it is not known up to now. So let me then come to the, the, the subject of today, the symmetries. Uh, how these are related to algebras. And entropies. So to, to do that, I, I want first to describe um, what are the relations of between algebras and regions more, more concretely. Then suppose you have a, 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 a S is a set of operators. And we, we make out of this some other set of operators that is the commutant, which are all the operators such that they commute with, with the, the operators in S. This is the commutant of S. And there is a nice um, characterization of what is an algebra by von Neumann. Well, von Neumann algebra of operators in Hilbert space. Is a, is a set of operators so that it is equal to the double commutant. This is called the double commutant theorem. Now, thinking in regions of a space, we, we have a reach, if you, if you take a region, L in space, including in Minkowski space. We can also produce another region, let's call it L prime, that is a set of points in Minkowski space, such that these points are especially spatial 
spatial separative to L. And this, we call it the causal complement. <clears throat> For example, and, and then we define causal region as a set of regions such that R is equal to R double causal complement. What is this? Well, this is just these diamond regions. If you have a, some region L, then you take the complement. The complement is all space-time separated, spatial separated points of L with respect to L. And then this is L prime. And then this region R is equal to L second causal complement. And R is equal to R double causal complement. So we see that there is a kind of um, agreement between this and this. And in fact, a quantum field theory is an assignation of an algebra to some causal region. And this is called a net. This assignation is called a net of operators. So let, let us see more closely what, what are the, the expected properties of this net, of this type of nets that define quantum field theory. So what are the relations between algebras and regions? So the basic relations are the following. First, if you have a, a region that is included in another one, then you want to assign an algebra to the smaller region that is included in the algebra of the larger one. And this is called isotony. And it's quite natural because otherwise you don't know, you don't have a meaning to, to say that an operator is localized in some region. If it is localized in the smaller region, it must be localized also in the larger one. And the second basic relation is that if you have a region that is included in some other region in the complement of in the causal complement of some other region, so these two are special, R1 and R2 are spatially separated, then the algebras must commute, mean that algebra of R1 <coughs> is included in the algebra of R2 prime. This is the commutant. And this is called causality. <clears throat> and you, you can also write this as that the algebra of R1 must be included in the algebra of R1 prime prime. If you have some diamond R1, This is R1 prime. <clears throat> so the operators here must commute with operators here. So in the algebra here must be included in the commutant of the algebra outside. So these are basic relations that we always expect. Of course, if you have firm fermions, this is not exactly like that, but uh, changing commutants by uh, by anti-commutants, you can, you can uh, express the same type of idea. Uh, then these are basic relations, but what, what we could expect as a maximal possible uh, relation between algebras and regions, so the maximal harmony between algebras and regions,
then you you could you you could ask more. You could ask that this relation, this inclusion, uh, saturates. So the algebra of R is equal to the algebra of R prime prime, and this is called hack duality. And it's a kind of completeness of the, the algebra in the sense that any operator that you can add, you are adding. And another, another possible relation that you could expect is that the algebra of R1, algebra of R2, where this symbol is just the generated algebra of the two. So A1, a2 is equal to A1 union A2 double commutant. So it's a minimal algebra that includes both of the, of the algebras. And you can expect that this is equal to the algebra of R1 union R2. And this is called additivity. E this relation means something like if you have a large region and you decompose it in smaller ones, the operators in the larger region will be generated by operators in smaller regions, as happens typically in a field theory. The operators are all generated by field operators and point operators. A third relation that you could expect is that the algebra of R1 intersection, the algebra of R2, this intersection is always an algebra, is equal to the algebra of R1 intersection R2. And this is also always a causal region. And this we can call intersection property. Uh, it turns question. out that the yes. Uh, and just a clarification. So for the additivity on the right hand side at the equality, is that a union between two R's? Is that sorry? Is that a union between the two R's? Well, uh, this is again R one union R two double causal complement. But in fact, in all what I want to discuss today is uh, we, I, I am thinking always in regions based in a, in a same Cauchy surface. So I, I, will I will think mainly of regions as pieces of a Cauchy surface, C. So in that case, you can think it's just the union. So of course, when you do the causal development, if you have these two things, so these are the regions in the, in the same, the same Cauchy surface, then if you do the, the union and then the double, the double causal complement, you get a bigger diamond here. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see, thank you. <clears throat> Can I ask a general question? If we want yeah. to extend the additivity property for non-local operators, what changes? Well, I, 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 I am going to talk about this exactly today. Okay. I guess so, I have, uh, oh, yeah. sorry. I also have a question about like what we assume about the regions are, like if we assume connectedness or like that it's an open set or something. Cause I remember it was mentioned before that like the reach leader theorem like doesn't hold on null lines or something like that. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm always thinking in now in regions that have a space time volume. So they are, the, the easiest way to think about them is just take a Cauchy surface, let's say T equals to zero surface. And then we take some region here. And then we, you can do the, the double causal complement and it give you the diamond. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to think today mainly on regions because this, uh, this region in the, this piece of a spatial surface automatically define the diamond. I will label my regions by just pieces of a Cauchy surface are equal to zero, let's say to simplify matters. So today I'm not much interested in the causal structure as in the last lectures, okay?
So it turns out that the, this intersection property is implied by one and two. So I will talk more mostly about hack duality. And additivity. So um, I will forget about this because it's just a consequence of the other two. And in the same way, you can you can see that one and three imply two. So you can you can either talk about additivity or <clears throat> or or the intersection property. So somehow the intersection and the union are kind of dual things. Once you have the the the, the complement. So uh, with with these operations, with these operations, the inclusion, the complement, the intersection, and the union, both uh, causal regions. And algebras are also complemented lattices in a mathematical sense of lattice theory. That is a is a theory of uh, of of some uh, order order sets. So, but this is just a, a commentary. Um, so, and the relations one and two imply that there is a, an, an homomorphism of orthocomplemented lattices. Uh, when we have one and two, we, we, we can say that the theory, we have a complete theory. Hi, uh, just a question. Yes. Is, is, could you quickly define what you mean by ortho complete or complemented? Yeah, well, uh, if you have a, an order relation, you have what is called a poset, or it's just an order set. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, this give you uh, a unique element. So it's kind of um, um, it, it, this give you in, in this order sets a unique element that reverses the order relation. This intersection and union give you the 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 lowest upper bound and the highest I don't know <laughs> lower bound. So it's it's like the supremum and the infimum of two two elements. Mm -hmm. So if you have some basic axioms of this, it give you an also complemented lattice. Okay, so uh, it's just defined by having those four properties. Those four uh, by having these operations, these operations and, and relations between them, natural relations, okay, between them. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so if you have a one and two, we, we will that is a maximal harmony between algebra and region, we, we call it a complete theory. So you have a complete theory. Uh, for example, uh, free scalar. Have these relations. Hmm? Basically, it's the only case that is, has been shown completely because it is, these are different things, difficult things to to prove mathematically, in, in particular, you need uh, the, the mathematical uh, uh, the definition of your theory uh, completely. You know? So if you have an interactive theory, nobody have, uh, in most cases, um, produce these algebras or, or, or can control the things. Uh, but still, we can think physically in many, many cases. And what we want to understand is when, when these, uh, these nice features uh, are broken. Mm -hmm. So we will see that symmetries, ordinary symmetries, 
are related to violations of additivity and duality. So this is quite bizarre. One, one, one usually thinks, well, symmetries are very good things and they try to, to make things more harmonic or more uh, and not less. But here is uh, on, the, on the contrary, they, they produce some features that violate some basic assumptions that one can make. Uh, so suppose that we will, we will make an assumption here to simplify things. We will make an assumption that assume duality and additivity hold for topologically trivial region. So the topology of balls and, 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 and complements. balls. <clears throat> this is not always the case. There are some examples where this, this does not hold. For example, general free fields, the typical general free fields that appear in, um, in the large and limit in holographic theories, they do not satisfy this. But in general, we expect this, this satisfied for, by for normal quantum field theories. So in, in this situation, you can you can define what is an we can be, you can define an additive net. Where, uh, where the algebra of a region R that is topologically non-trivial, for example, is just the union of the algebras of all balls included in the region. Automatically, this define a net. There is no problem doing that with, with, with causality. Uh, and, and it's somehow the minimal net. Is a minimal net possible because the algebra of, of balls included in R are automatically included in any algebra of the region R that you can define. But given that, you can define then for a region R, a maximal algebra, which is the commutant of the minimal one of the complementary region. And this is the maximal algebra for are compatible with causality. Otherwise, if you put more operators, they will not commute with the reality of algebra in R prime. Mm -hmm. So if these two things, the maximal and the additive one are not They are not equal. It must be the case that the maximal algebra, which is equal to the additive one, it must be equal to the additive plus some other some operators. Mm -hmm. And the same for the complementary region. Some operators B. So in this case, the A and B operators are non locally generated. 
in R and R prime because otherwise will be additive, right? The additive one is just the, the ones that are locally generated in the region. So these A and Bs are not locally generated. However, by our assumption, they are locally generated in balls containing R and R prime. So it's not the case that these operators are really impossible to generate locally, but they need a topologically trivial region that contains this operator in order to be generated locally. We will see some examples very soon. Um, well, one thing in this situation is that these non-locally generated operators form part of an algebra. This, this is an algebra. So it must be the case that if you multiply them, if you multiply them, you, you get another non-local operator. So there, are, there must be fusion rules, such as A1, A2, is equal to some combination, linear combination and the same for this. This in fact is, is true for the equivalence classes. of non-local operators. But in general, you can, you can find some particular members of the different equivalent, equivalent classes with respect to non-local operators multiplied by additive ones. In, in general, you can find some particular, not easily constructed operators where these relations hold with where these are numbers. Um, so the, these algebras of fusion rules of these non-local operators then somehow bring the idea of symmetries. And in, in some particular cases, these are in fact algebras of related to, to groups. Another point is that the A's and the B's cannot all commute to each other. Sorry. Um, yes. So can you just uh, precise how you, you get the fact that, you know, the, the right hand side does not depend on the representative that you choose? Like in the sense that if I have a local operator times A1 and then another local operator times A2. Yeah. What guarantees no, in that? General, in general, this, in ge what I said is that in general, these, not, these things are additive operators, right? But it is, it is uh, possible to choose particulars A1s and A2s in such a way that these are numbers. Uh, and I3s, right? Right, yeah, I, I guess my question was, um... If, if you choose general A1s and A2s, so ones such that these are not necessarily numbers but can be operators. Yeah. What guarantees that the members of the sum on the right hand side don't change? Like that you wouldn't have A3s that appear for some choices and don't appear for some other choices. No, it, it will not happen. It will not happen. It's not easy to, to say, <laughs> but it will not happen. Yeah. Okay. No, okay. no. No, because otherwise, if you if you if you you can think in this way. Suppose you do that, it means that uh, the thing is not anymore a, lo a non-local operator. So suppose that this is zero here, and you have only you have only the identity. So you have a right. Okay. I, I think so um, you you can divide you can divide the operators in the algebra a, ma a max oh, sorry, in into equivalence classes 
equivalent classes. Yeah. Uh, and the, each of these equivalent classes um, is, is, is uh, represented by one of these A's. And then the product is between equivalent classes and, and there is no possibility. Right. That. Yeah, yeah, I guess. So is it easy to prove that, you know, this relation holds like descends to the equivalence classes or is there something non-trivial to, to prove there? The, the, this relation you mean? Yeah, like, uh, that, like, like if you go to the quotient to the equivalence classes, then it doesn't depend on the representative and everything's well-defined. Like, is it something easy to prove or, or do you need to work um, to prove it? Oh, mm, I, I don't remember well how it was, but I think it's not, it's not difficult, yeah. Okay. It's not difficult. okay, thanks. So one, one thing that you can do to check that is, is somehow to use the, to use the non-local operators in the, in the complementary region. So, it turns out that these B's and these A's have non-trivial commutation relations, but these B's commute with the additive algebra. So if you, if you take one of these B's and you made a commutation relation uh, with the A's, if you add uh, multiplied by an additive operator, it will not change. So, and this, somehow the B's are the ones that you use to Define the, the equivalent classes in, in this in this algorithm. You can you can you can also like uh, uh, produce uh, like projectors out of the bees, such a way that they project in the different equivalent classes. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Um. So the A, B, the A and Bs cannot commute to, to all to each other because otherwise it would be the case that the maximal algebra would be included in the maximal algebra of our prime, prime because it will commute the B's commute with the A's. Uh, the, if the B's commute with the A's, then you have that, but this is just the additive algebra of R. And, and you, are, you are thinking that these are not equal. Mm -hmm. So it cannot com they, they cannot commute to each other. So you, in particular, you cannot choose the maximal algebra for each region R of your space time because it will not satisfy causality. So A max, contrary to the additive one, is not a net. So, but this was enough for the abstract thing. Let, let, me, let me show some particular example that we simplify things. For example, we have a global symmetry group G of a theory. So for example, we have a, a theory F where you have all fields. And with this theory, automatically we can produce another one that is called the orbifold in such a way that the operators here are invariant under the group and the global group. So this algebra is the fixed point of this algebra under the action of the global group. <clears throat> so O is, is what is called a subnet of F. Um, and there is also a theorem that is called DHR theorem, 
that tells that F can be reconstructed from O. So really, if you have a global symmetry, you have the this algebra and this algebra are equivalent. You you can have you can you can create one of the uh, from the other. And it's important that also that this orbifold algebra is somehow more physical in the sense that really, if you have a for example the baryon number, you, you cannot have uh, an operator with a with non-zero baryon number in a laboratory because otherwise you could um, act on the vacuum and create baryon number out of nothing, right? So really um, observable observable fields belong to the orbifold algebra. So, uh, and we will see that O has algebra region problem. Or regions with non trivial pi zero homotopy group or the, the complementary regions that have pi d minus two non trivial. Pi zero is a, is a homotopy group. Pi zero means that the region R has more than one connected to component. For example, and this is easy to see how this happened. You have two balls, let me call it A and B. And then you can put an operator, charge operator here with respect to your group, some representation. These are indices with the representation. And here you have the same representation by dagger. So this operator IR sum over on the indices. belongs to the orbifold algebra is invariant and the, and the group operations, but is non-additive non in AB, in a, because you cannot produce, produce it by multiplying operators here and operators here in, in O, because uh, the charge operators do not belong to the, to the net O. Hmm? So they belong to AB. They can be put as an operator in AB, but they, they are not additive. And, and what happens in the complementary region that we can call C? Well, there is another, there should be, there should be another operator, dual operator. which is called the twist. Which is just the, the operator that implements group operations in a region. And and so it, this twist operator implements a group operation here, but nothing outside. It leaves operators outside invariant. Um, oh, sorry. Um, in fact, to to be uh, invariant, the group under the group, you have to form the sum of these operators over the equivalence class, the conjugacy class. Of the group. 
So really, these are the ones that are invariant the, the group. And now we can we can think what happens with uh, the additive algebras and the maximal ones. If you take the additive algebra of AB prime, it will contain the additive algebra of the complement naturally, but it will, it will also contain the twist operators. Because the twist operators, the additive algebra of the two balls do not contain charge operators in any of the balls. So the twist operator that implements the group operations will commute with, with, this, with these elements. So it will, it will belong to the, the, the commutant of the additive algebra of the two balls. If you take the additive algebra of the complement and make the commutant, it will contain the additive operators in AB, but it will also contain the intertwiners. Um, sorry, can I just ask a quick question about these twist operators? Yes. Um, is, is there any is there any sort of uh, subtlety that goes into their construction? Just, I was just thinking, cause I guess if you try to do like implement the boost just on the right, you know, Rindler wedge, then that's, that's not well-defined. So is there some uh, care that has to go into the construction or? Well, you, you are talking about uh, um, Poincare symmetries. Poincare symmetries can also be, ah, can right. also, you, you can also produce twist operators out of Poincare symmetry. What you are saying is more on how you define the twist. Here I, I, I wrote a line for the twist. But in fact, in order that this is a real operator, it has to have some width where, well, it, it implements the group operations from here to there. It does no, do nothing from here to there. And there is a gap there, at least some, some width, in order that the operator is really an unitary operator, let's say, or well-defined operator. So you have to smear the operators. There, what it doesn't exist is a non-smear operator. Ah, OK. OK, great. So in the case, in the case of, of the boost operator, you have to smear at the, at the, Rindler, at the Rindler corner, let's say. Ah, OK. OK, thanks. So I, I'm I'm always about talking about non-local operators that are smear, never mm -hmm. never are line operators strictly speaking because otherwise it, they they always these line operators or these sharp operators always have expectation value zero and I don't want to right so it's like a limit where it's ex exactly zero it's it's too too much fluctuations because it's very sharp. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So one, one thing you can see from here is that they, they are the same number, same number of operators because these are conjugacy classes, these are representations, and these are for finite groups, they, they are the same, the same number. And what about the, um, um, the fusion rules? Uh, sorry, just a quick question. Yeah. Um, so What's the argument precisely for saying that both inclusions hold? So we, we showed that um, the additive operators and the twist operators were inside O additive prime. But what, what shows the other inclusion that actually this generates the whole algebra? Well, um, it's, it's, it's an interesting question, difficult one uh, in the sense of of uh, so if, if you are talking about non-local operators, so operators uh, that then these these are the ones that appear. But you you may wonder because because in this um, in this commutant relation uh, is very subtle and people uh, will have to show that this is exactly equal. We are like neglecting this uh, type of um, 
purely mathematical, uh, let's say you ultra violet problem. It's, it's a ultra violet problem to say that it is exactly equal. So for example, for the scalar field, it's not easy to show that uh, it has satisfies duality, right? So if you, if you to simplify the matter, if you, if you take a lattice, you can show it easily that this is the case. So if, if there are some issues, it must be the something ultraviolet, something that we are not talking about here. Right. So we're sort of assuming that this holds because it's reasonable. And uh, in certain simple theories, we know it holds. Yeah, it holds. And you can show it in a lattice that it holds. OK, thanks. Uh, well, the fusion rules. Uh, are, are as expected, for example, is just the fusion rules of representations. So these are the number of representations are two, uh, sorry, are three, that appears in the tensor product of, the, of these two. And the same happens for conjugacy classes. So, this is, was an example for these connected regions. And now I, 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 I show you another example that is in the literature, is, this is called one form symmetries. Uh, that appear in some gauge theories. Uh, and where um, the, the algebra region problems appear for non-trivial pi one r or pi or dually pi d minus three of r prime. For example, you in the case you have a a ring like region. And then you have a kind of non local line operator A. And in the complement, you will have another, in four dimensions, you will be another line operator B. In this case, the structure is quite simple and you can actually prove uh, completely. Um, abstractly, that uh, <clears throat> the non local operators form abelian algebras. In fact, abelian groups. Um, so the A's, the B's form a group. And the A's form the dual group, which is just the group of one dimensional because it's a billion of representations that is called this G. So this is the representation of G. So one of one is the representation of the other, let's say. And in fact, the commutation relations are fixed. You, you have A and B, A times C is equal to a number that is just the character EA. So how this connects with gauge theories? You, you can tentatively think that the A operator must be some kind of Wilson loop. So tentatively, we can think of the Wilson loop with some representation of some gauge group 
You have a path ordering. The mu field in some representation. However, if you have some field, point field of some representation R, you can form the Wilson line And this operator, so now is an operator of a line, put in several of these, you can break up, you can break uh, a Wilson loop. So the Wilson loop or representation can be, can be broken into pieces and then it's additive. So it's not local, it's not non-local, it's not non-local operator. In particular, for, for non-abelian non -abelian gauge theories, you can always form this Wilson line with the F mu nu, which, which is in the adjoint representation in the joint representation so it means that the joint representation uh, and then this takes away many almost all the wilson loops that you can think of they are non local <clears throat> for example as you do, case theory, you have the representations are labeled by spins. The joint representation is the representation of a spin one. The products of a joint generate all integer spin. And with that, you show that all the integer spin representations are breakable, are additive. And then you have only the representation as non-local one half or equivalently the three half, et cetera, which are just the one half times integer spin. So local operator. So in that case for SU2, you have a set two group of non-local operators. And in the same way for SUN, you have a set N group, which is abelian and it's very small, but it's still very interesting. And <clears throat> The dual operators are called tough loops, which I will not describe in detail, but are somehow the natural dual of these are instead of being like magnetic flux or electric flux. and are labeled by elements of the gauge group center. And you have the commutation relation
the same as we said before. <clears throat> so what happens with the other gauge symmetries? Well, as you know, gauge symmetries are not really symmetries, are parameterization invariances. So we only, it only uh, remains this particular kind of, uh, of one form symmetries um, in this case. So these are examples of theories we have algebras and region problems, and you can think there are many other different topologies and different dimensions that you can have different kind of symmetries. Um, and then uh, how, 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 long, how much time do I have? Uh, you have uh, 15 minutes. Oh, gee, oh, gee, oh, gee. <laughs> okay, mm. well, is 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 just enough to define what uh, my entropic order parameters. Okay. So the idea is to profit here. This is based mainly on on works and two works in, in the last year and this year by uh, with Javier Magan, Marina Huerta, and Diego Pontello. So the idea is to profit from the fact that the, the fact that the, there are more than one algebra for the same region. In these theories with symmetries, there is there is the possibility of choosing different algebra for the same region, that which is not the usual case. So and one natural quantity one would like to use is the relative entropy. Because it's well defined that it hasn't got hasn't got any divergences or problems. But the relative entropy depends on one algebra and two regions, no, so, uh, sorry, and two states. And here we have uh, two algebras, for example, and one state. So we have to, we have to fix that. For that, we, we, I'm, I'm introducing what is called conditional expectation. Conditional expectation exists when you have a subalgebra n, let's say, of, a, of an algebra m. And the conditional expectation is a mapping from the big algebra to the smaller one, which is a linear positive map to channel. to the subalgebra that keeps the subalgebra invariant. More precisely, the property that it obeys is that if you have an element of the subalgebra, an element of the algebra, another element of the subalgebra, this go outside. And here the importance is that it is it can be used to lift a state. So if you if you have a state of the subalgebra, you can create another one for the algebra for the bigger algebra as the composition of the state in the subalgebra with the condition expectation. This is, is a state in the big algebra. Here the 
the examples of the condition expectations, for example, we have again this case, we have an operator and here the dagger, and then the condition expectation that takes the algebra with the intertwiner to the one without the intertwiner is produced exactly by the dual operators. So, so, so for example, in this case would be e to the n, e for m equal to the average over the group. And it's clear that this average over the group eliminates the charge operator here, so it, it, it eliminates the intertwiner. So this is an additive operator. Well, given that, we can, we can define what is the entropic order parameter. is just the relative entropy in the algebra maximal, in the maximal algebra of some state and the state composed with the condition expectation. In, in general, this is the vacuum. And this one is the vacuum, but kills non-local operators. Is you, you first act with the condition expectation that kills non local operator and then act with the vacuum, for example, then this omega composite E for some non local operators will give you zero, while for the local operators it gives you just the vacuum expectation value. So this thing measures how different are these two states, it's a measure of uh, distinguishability, and then secretly it measures expectation values of non-local operators, because here expectation value of A is different from zero, and here is equal to zero. And given this situation, we have something that is called complementarity diagram. which if I take a region R, I have the maximal algebra. I take the condition expectation and it goes to the additive algebra. And then I am taking the commutants of these algebras. This goes to the additive algebra of R prime. And this goes to the additive algebra the maximal algebra. And then there is also a dual condition expectation that goes from the maximal algebra in R prime to the max to the additive algebra in R prime. Under this condition for a pure global state, we have a relation between the entropic order parameters that we have called the entropic certainty relation. That is the following. So these are the two order parameters, one for the region R and the, the corresponding one for the complementary region. And these add up to some specific number, we call it log lambda. And this number is fixed. It doesn't depend on the state. It doesn't depend on the, on the, on the, topo, on the, on the geometry of the region. It's just a number. In particular, in, in all cases I, I have described, this is just the logarithm of the size of the group. 
in general, for more general cases, this is called the index of the inclusion of, of algebras. Uh, of the AMAX. Of this inclusion, it's a mathematically defined number. So it's quite geometrical number. is um, is a is a fixed number. So you have that the relative entropy for the let's say the order parameter, the disorder parameter, the relative entropy for the Wilson loop and the tough loops or the intertwiners and twists are related to each other. And what is the content of physical content of this is somehow why we call it certainty relation because it looks like very much an, an uncertainty relation. This, this relation tells this relation tells that one thing that, that it, it tells is that the S max of R is less than log G because, because these are two positive numbers and some add up to log G. So each one is less than, let me call it to simplify R prime, uh, is, uh, the, the relative entropy in R prime is, is also less than log G. But you can see from this relation, from the certain relation that they cannot be at the same time log G. Not saturate at the same time. And this is this is related because when when is that when is happens that it saturates the relation E is the case when these states are maximally different between each other. It means that the expectation values of the non-local operators are near one. This is maximum, these are unitary operators and then maximal expectation value is one. But then it cannot happen that the maximal expectation value of the B is one at the same time because they do not commute to each other. So somehow, it has in, inside the information of the uncertainty relations. Between the non-commuting operators, A's and B's. But it's nice that it's an uncertainty relation, but it's in fact an, an equation. It's an equation, not an inequality. Well, I think my time is almost, how much do we have? Um, you know, you can take a, a few more minutes because your last lecture, so. Okay. Just don't. But if you want to make some question. Um, yeah. Okay, well, no, I, let, me, let me then say why, something. Why you, yeah. Yeah, why don't you wrap up? Something. Yeah. Yeah, something about some kind of uh, more more physical content or something like that. Suppose such an example. An example. Suppose you have a, this case uh, where, where we have this intertwiner operator, and then we evaluate the the relative entropy order parameter, uh, and the question is, uh, we know that this belongs to zero log G. So it's a positive number and it's upper bounded by log G. When is that it's going to zero and when it's going to G, log G? Well, it's natural to understand that it all depends on the expectation values of this non-local operator, this intertwining here. So when they these two balls are very far separated to each other, or the balls are small, then the radiant or the parameter will go to zero. And when these balls touch each other, this will go to log G. And interestingly, in this limit, when they touch each other, it, 
this entropy, this relative entropy does not depend on the geometry. That you, you can add pieces here, move these regions, make them touch more in the boundary, whatever, or make one outside the other, touching each other, and then it's always log G. And in particular, in this example, it turns out that this relative entropy order parameter is in fact equal to the differences. Let me call these two balls A and B. Is, is equal to the differences between the mutual information in the, in the full theory minus the mutual information in the orbifold. So it tells us that this orbifold, in fact, what happens is that this orbifold has this topological contribution. It is it's a contribution when these two regions touch each other that is quite topological. And in fact, if you, if you think the mutual information as a regularization of the entropy, uh, you have delta i equal to log g for very small epsilon. So it means that the area terms in the two mutual informations as they approach each other cancel, they are equal, but there is a difference in the constant term. And you can see also that if you have regions more complicated, for example, your A, this is A, this is A, this is A, and B is outside, will go like the number of boundaries times log G. So it's really a topological number that appears there. Which is a, which is a produced by the constraints that the that the mutual information in the orbifold has because in the in the orbifold each of the regions have to be neutral while the in you know while not neutral in a in the theory with charges. Well, I think I, I, I will finish here. If you want to know more, there is some more things in the, in the lecture notes that I put in, in the wiki. Thank you, Horacio. Um, let's have a few questions. Uh, so is this uncertainty relation still true on a lattice where you can never get the regions to actually touch? Oh, the, the certainty relation uh, is true in the lattice. So this, this, this relation is true in the lattice, but uh, you have to be careful with, with uh, what you take in the lattice as your condition expectation and your condition expectation dual. So it happens that uh, this condition expectation that map an algebra to a subalgebra, uh, in general, they are not, um, they are not unique. Mm -hmm. So in the lattice, the way you, you choose an algebra and the complement depends on the details you take in the boundary. You can take centers, you can take. Um, so uh, you have to take the condition expectations um, uh, precisely to be dual to each other, and then you get this relation. In the continuum, it happens that these conditional expectations are unique. So this relation is much nicer, is much nicer in the continuum because the, um, uh, the conditional expectations um, are unique. Um, um, and, and so they, they are just defined the, by the, by the non-local operators and that's it. Thank you. 
I, I, um, I might follow up with a question about that. Um, you said earlier in your previous lectures that, uh, you know, people try to emphasize this type three versus type one. And, yeah. <laughs> and it, isn't this an exactly like there are many facts that you stated right yeah. now, I think that maybe hinge on the type three nature, like the yeah, unique yeah, yeah, the yeah. conditional expectation and things like that. Yeah, here what uh, what um, what happens is that what is important for this uniqueness is that um, one is it quite strange is that for example you have the algebra of the orbifold and the other algebra that has these uh, um, charge operators and one is included in the other but the relative commutant so both of both of first both of these of these algebras are expected not to have any center because in the continuum the center will be something that is just in the boundary it commutes with everything inside so and you cannot localize really nothing that is a bounded operator or, or even an operator in Hilbert space in a d minus two dimensional region it's too it's too singular you, you the smearing is too singular to produce an operator so the First of all, the algebras in the continuum do not have center in general. And the second point is that the relative commutant, so the um, A additive um, prime intersection A max is just the identity. So they, they have a trivial relative commutant. There is nothing more there. Um, even if one is, is bigger than the other, the, if you do the relative, com so it, what this, this means, this means that in order, uh, you, you cannot um, <clears throat> produce, um, for example, an intertwiner here. Oh, let me, let me say it for the twist that is simple. If you, you cannot produce a twist outside, which commutes with everything, uh, with a, uh, with everything outside, with every local operator outside. Otherwise, it will be a twist that is very sharp here in the boundary, and again, it's not an operator. So these things, of, of course, these things simplify the, the structure. They simplify the structure. Um, uh, yes, they. In, the, in that sense, for this type of things, it's better to think in the in the continuum directly. If you have, if you go to the to, yeah, the, I mean, to the lattice, you have a many like uh, choosings uh, to do, right. etc. Yeah, I mean that triviality of the relative commutant is impossible on the lattice. It's not. Yeah, it's, it's no, really no. impossible. In the lattice, yeah. it's impossible. <laughs> so yeah, it's impossible. As you may, as you go to the continuum limit, these centers that appear, right, etc., right. they go mm, to zero, yeah. mm -hmm. etc. But uh, yeah, it's, it's impossible. But, but see, seeing that, like that, that is a nice physical picture. But seeing it seems tricky without the continuum limit. So yeah, yeah. It, it's, I mean, yeah. But, the words but, that you said but, make but are nice and they the make sense day. physically. But yeah, yeah. What I was saying the other day is that it's not that uh, that the. That some people say that in the in the algebraic uh, community that the quantum field theory is some like world apart from the lattice model, right? in the sense that they have three type three algebras and not type one algebra, so it's completely different. I wouldn't go that far. I would say, well, some things are simplified, as in any continuum theory with respect to a lattice or something like that, which have more details. But uh, I wouldn't say that it's uh, conceptually an uh, intersection zero. Yes, <laughs> that that was the point I was making the other day. But of course, I, of I, course, as you as you have the continuum tools, uh, some some things are still yeah. Um, are there any other questions? Quick questions. Uh, yeah, I guess I would have a question. Um, it's so it's about this uh, DHR reconstruction. Um, yeah. So yeah, I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on how it's done because I've come across this a few times in the literature and I always find it confusing. So 
like when you yeah. go from the orb folded thing to like the the general yeah well yeah. the idea is How that it exactly is it just a semi-direct product or sorry? is it more complicated just like a semi-direct product with respect to some group or is it more complicated than that no the the, the reason why why you can reconstruct is very simple is the fact that um Suppose you have a set two charge, set two charge, uh, just an operator. Um, um, then you can say, well, what is the difference between these two models? You have a, all local operators, yeah, some operator here, and the operators in the other theory just can have these operators O, and then there is an operator, let's say phi at some point. So the content, the, the the content of operators in O is uh, in F is greater than the content of operator in O just by one, one, one single operator in some point, mm -hmm. any point, because you can, you can move this operator to other regions, just multiplying, for example, phi dagger here, phi. So you can move the position of your charge operator multiplying. So you can say, well, then I can move it to infinity, this, this charge operator. So the theories really do not differ much, much with each other locally. So, uh, so how do you reconstruct? The idea is that you have a, a ball, for example, another ball, and then you have an operator that is this one, this intertwiner, in these two balls. Uh, that belongs to to the orbifold, right? But then you you can move this ball to infinity, very far, and then it still it still belongs to O. But at the end, in the limit, when you when this is you push it to infinity, you get a theory that. Uh, effectively contains a charge operator there. So this is the way they construct, how they construct the charge operators. So in order to go from O to F, you have to construct the charge operator. The charge operator are constructed as limits of intertwiners when one of the balls goes to infinity. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess uh, a follow-up question would be, so. If so, you, you construct these intertwiners, you have these intertwiners between representations, and those give you the, um, the charged operators. But then I, I guess what's always confusing me what's the multiplication rule between? So, for example, if you have a local operator times a non local operator times another local operator times another non local operator, how do you multiply them? Like, do you have to twist by something, or do you just... yeah, well, uh, this, is, this is a story on how, how you get this charge operator. How you prove that? Um, so they started from some other, but um, how would you prove that you have always a group? There is more complicated if you are thinking about that. It's more complicated, yeah. You have to understand how these uh, intertwiners multiply and all that. Right. Um... Yeah, okay, so, but, but I guess so if you're in two different representations, like if, if you have a local operator times an intertwiner, so that, that gives you like a, a first, like you're in, in one sector and then you multiply it with another element of another sector, like how does the local bit commute with the non-local bit of the, of the first operator? Um, maybe I'm unclear, sorry. Oh, so yeah, like, you are, you are, you are like, with, sorry, yeah. I don't understand really how uh, the question very well. So, you are trying to multiply two intertwiners. So, say, for example, you have you have a local op so the operators in the big theory are like local operators of the order folded theory times a non local operator, right? Is that what you said? A non-local operator, you mean a charge operator? Yeah, sorry, like one of these charged operators yeah. that move between sectors. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. 
So then if you multiply two charged operators together, well, you have the fusion rules that tell you how to do right. that. But then you still have like the local bits in front of each, right? Yeah, okay, okay. Well, but the, well, you have to, <laughs> so the- Like you would have a first have O. This, this here, you say. Yeah, like how do I treat this O in the middle? Do I just commute it? No, with... you, can, you can put it here, right? You can, so you can show that, uh, so suppose you have a, some class, right? Some class, you can always write this, you, you, and you choose a, a single element of this class. So this is like single out the, this element. Then any element of this class can be written as a local operator times CR, or yeah. PR O prime. You can always write in, in both sides. Okay. This is just a um, yeah, mathematical theory of these things, um, rings of operators. You, you can do that. Okay, and so the O prime would not necessarily be the same as the O. No, 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 it, it will be generally different. But you can you can push it to the other side with another. This is another another local operator. Okay, and so how, how do you construct it? Like how do you push it? Is there a systematic way to do it or? Oof. Oh. Yeah, sorry, maybe that's too technical. I don't want to bore everyone. Yeah, I don't really know. I think it's not like a physical way. I mean. Uh, you you prove that it's possible, right? People do that. Uh, you prove that, it's, of course, it will depend on what you choose here. It will depend on what you choose. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Okay, are there any other really quick questions? Um, Okay, uh, if not, let's let's uh, break there and thank Horatio again for the wonderful series of lectures.